My first guest is Mandy Salagari, therapist, author, and co-founder of Charter Harley Street. Okay, it's incredibly painful um, having alcoholism. Uh, it's really what happened to me, or indeed to anyone else, that meant I wanted to use something self-destructive. Self-esteem is how I feel about myself and therefore how I treat myself. I mean, I took coke to feel comfortable with everyone. Oh my God, I am the common denominator in everything that's <laughs> happened in my life. I know you worked with Nikki Graham. She was a sweetheart. I mean, really, what a sweetheart. I mean, she was institutionalised, I think it was from nine till 20, which is why Big Brother was just such a spot on space for her, because she was back into a contained environment. The real world, no. What I would really like to help you to do is to... Mandy, we obviously we've met before. I invited you to take part of the documentary that I'm creating on trauma and you're my first guest, so welcome. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I want to find out a bit more about you. What got you into working with trauma and addiction and all these sorts of things? Well, it was my own recovery. So I used to work in um, television and I was a producer. I used to work in pop promos and commercials, things like that. And uh, when I went to rehab in 1990, uh, my life changed completely and I mean it was just an amazing experience rehab I was talking to somebody about it on the way here actually about what rehab is because people always think medical model diagnoses focus on the substance um 28 days stop using whatever you're using and it's not my experience of rehab it's not what I did in rehab and it's mm. not what I provide in rehab either. Anyway, so how did I get into this field? I sat in that group setting back in 1990 and I remember thinking, I'm not really here to make friends with anybody else. I'm here to make friends with me and anybody else is a bonus. Mm. And uh, I was quite challenging of the group members. Um, in what way? Well, we used to have this group at the end of the week where there were maybe 20 people in the group. It was all residential. And they would, everybody would sit in a circle and they'd talk about their weekend plans, right? And uh, as I recall it, anyway, everybody had to agree if, say, somebody wanted a day pass or they wanted to go out at the weekend. And uh, the group would be like, you know, somebody in the group would go, yeah, I want to go out, I want to go shopping, I want to go and get some time away, I need a break, all this sort of stuff. And they'd go around the room and people would go, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, it sounds like a good idea. And it would come to me and I'd be like, a break from what? What do you mean a break? You don't get a break from recovery, you know. It's But recovery is a new way of life. Why do you want a break? I think you should stay. And so, of course, I became quite unpopular in a Why? way because I would be like, hold on a second, you know, it sounds like a relapse. It sounds like, because I think I was distrusting of systems. Yeah. Um, Did you associate that fun with going to do? Well, I just didn't trust anyone. And also, I suppose I wanted to be challenged as well. Mm. Um, so, and, I, and I didn't feel like I needed people to like me either. So I, would, I wasn't one of those people that needed everybody in the group to like me. I got a real kind of kick out of just being honest. I found this freedom in just being honest. You don't have to like it. But there was, I discovered in rehab a safety. You cannot fall off the truth. Mm. Before I went into rehab as an addict, I was a liar. I lied about everything, everything. You know, if you said to me, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to the shop. What are you going to buy? I'd say milk when I'm going to buy cigarettes, right? It makes no difference to you that I'm mm. buying milk or cigarettes. I just don't want you to know. I just don't want you to know. I don't want you to know me. I don't want you to know what I'm doing. I would lie about everything. Big lies, Is that, little was that lies. like a defense mechanism? Sure. Yeah. You know, I don't want you to know me. I don't want you close. I will tell lies. I will, you know, manipulate what you know about me. Even if it means you think ill of me, I don't care. I create what you think of me, you don't get a chance to make your own mind up. Mm. And actually it was incredibly, I mean, I see that as one of the core characteristics of addiction. But yes. Yeah. It's a control thing, isn't it? Totally. You know, I am a... controlling by lying. I am controlling my world, your perception of me. 
And I don't care if it means that you don't like me because I know I've constructed it. Mm. But if you come to not liking me of your own volition from knowing me, then I'm vulnerable and that's not going to happen. I didn't understand any of that at the time, of course. Yeah. But So I sat in these groups and I discovered quite early on this intoxicating freedom that actually all I needed to do was to tell the truth. And if I told the truth, there was nothing to hide, nothing to feel ashamed of, nothing to run from, just... I could just tell the truth. And it, I found it, um, I mean, for a start, I think it, I was probably quite brutal. And um, it was such a freedom that I was like, you know, to tell the truth. Too honest, maybe. Yeah, too honest, you know. <laughs> so I thought and you could have maybe kept scary. to yourself. Yeah. And, and over the years, I've learned how to soften that a bit. But, but that's what I really got a hold of. And so when I came out of treatment, I knew I wanted to work in this field. All my life I'd had stuff projected onto me about, you know, going on the stage. I used to sing, I was an actress, I was all those things, um, and a model. And this whole sort of career was ahead of me. I got into television um, and everyone around me was really supportive, could really see me going that way. And then I find myself in a rehab in this room and I just felt at home. I just clicked. So I went back to television somewhat reluctantly, I went back to television and I remember shooting a commercial and um, it, was a, it was a commercial that involved a glass of milk, right? And uh, this milk, wrong glass, can we get another glass, you know? And can we have the milk to there? Oh, there's some cream, can we wipe that off? Um, no, there's too much milk, no, a bit less milk, you know? This was you saying No, this, this was oh, the director, because right. I was the producer, right? right so okay. this was the director. Too much milk, not enough milk, wrong glass, blah. So I'm sending the runner off to go and get, you know, different milk, different glass. And uh, it, it gets it down there and the director made another comment and I was just like, oh, for fuck's sake. And the runner turned to me and said, I think you're done with this industry, the runner. And I looked at this person and I thought, you're right. <laughs> You know, you're right. point. But in commercials, you know, you think, right, that's the end of the commercial and you wrap it all up and so on. You do your budget. So everybody gets paid. Everything gets sorted. Commercial gets aired. And then I think, right, I'm going to leave. And of course, another project comes in. It's got money on it. And you think, yeah. oh, I could just turn this one around. So I got caught last up one. in it. Yeah, last one, last one. And I got caught up in it. Um, anyway, I did uh, leave the commercials world and I did go on to... Um, train actually i snuck in with a very well experienced therapist and i said do you need do you need any admin do you want me to do your notes from group and uh, they said yeah sure that would be great just sit quietly in group and do the notes so i sit quietly in group for a while and then i'm coming out of group and saying it's really interesting i saw this person do that and the therapist said well say something I'm like, great. So before you know, it's, I'm running the aftercare group. <laughs> Getting involved and you, yeah, you're fully yeah. in. And I'm like, wow. And I just loved it. It's like, it, you know, the, the requirement is to be in good shape yourself. I have to be emotionally in good shape. Yeah. My history of being, you know, chaotic and in an addict and all the kind of scenarios and traumatic stuff I've been through, that's all kind of like my... A levels and my master's degree, you know, because practical exam, you convert, you've passed it. You convert straw into gold, yeah. right? So it's a real rumple stilt skin moment. And um, to be allowed to sit in a room, be well, be honest. Somebody wants, they come in the room, sits down and says, Can you just give me an objective, as far as anyone can ever be objective, clear sighted view of what's going on in my life? So I listen and listen to them, always put my head on my right, always cross my legs, I've got a really achy back. Um, and just give, never give advice, but just give what I'm seeing so that the other person thinks. And you know, it's like, there are two places in the world where I really feel so connected in the moment that I'm not thinking. And it feels really pure. And one is when I'm singing and the other one is when I'm in group, particularly in group, a family setting, a couples, a big group therapy setting. I just feel um, free. I just feel completely free. You know, people say, how do you sit and listen to people all day long talking about their darkness? And I'm like, well, because people come to therapy out of hope, not despair. They come because they want eyes on. 
Mm. They want ears on. They want another perspective who's not involved, who's got experience, who isn't going to meddle, isn't going to give advice, isn't going to dive in with opinions. Mm. Um, See, yeah. I think, I mean, from my perspective, I've always thought of therapy as the other person giving that advice or, you know, putting their two pence into, you know, what, what they feel is either wrong with you and what you should do and all that sort of stuff. So it's not like that, is it? Well, I'm sure it is in some therapy sessions. Right. Um, some approaches would legitimise that, would legitimise the therapist being the expert and telling you what to do. But with addiction, if you think that the sort of core of addiction is outsourcing responsibility to something else, mm. right? Well, you can clean up from your drugs and your alcohol and your sex and love addiction and your exercise addiction and your work addiction and, and, and. Mm. Go and see a therapist and become dependent on them. That's the, yeah. You know, and who the hell am I to say how you should live your life? I mean, really, you come in, I know you for an hour a week or I know you for 10 hours. All I know is what you tell me. Yeah. Right? So how dare I tell you what you should do? Mm. But I can ask you questions. Yeah. And um, challenge things and help you chuckle at things uh, and get perspective and shift the shame so you've got a clearer view of what's going on. So, so what is your process then? I've come to you with a problem. You know, I, I suffered really badly with anxiety throughout my 20s. Um, and social, my social anxiety was through the roof. I could, like a conversation like this, I couldn't have. There was no connection. I'd be over, you know, hypervigilant. But let's say I come to you with that, that issue. What's, what's, your, what's, your, what's your first step? Well, you, you've hit one of my, my favourite nemesis. Oh, really? <laughs> so the word anxiety, people come in and they say, I'm anxious. Um, and my head's going, okay, which feeling are they repressing? Right, because anxious is not a feeling. It's not an emotion, it's a sensation. It's not an emotion. So if I ask you how you feel and you say, I feel anxious, I've got no idea how you feel. I know the sensation, but I don't know how you feel. Yeah. So my first thought when somebody comes in with anxiety is I wonder what they're not letting themselves experience because they've swallowed it down and they've somatized it. They've put it into their body yeah. and now they're experiencing physical symptoms, which they're describing as, as anxious, right? So somebody will come in and say, oh, I couldn't do that because I was anxious. I'm like, <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know, what What do you mean? Yeah. Um, and usually anxious is repressed anger, repressed shame or repressed fear. Yeah. Right? So they're the big ones. Yeah. Um, and then there'll be feelings about those feelings. So I'm frightened of being angry, so I don't get angry, so I swallow it. I become anxious. I'm frightened of not feeling good enough and of my shame, so I swallow it and I feel anxious so i'll start poking around to see i wonder how they experience shame or anger or fear so i might uh, initiate a conversation that i think might lead them to those emotions um maybe you know poke a little bit and see if they get angry uh see how you know fluid that feeling is um just try and see rather than ask them try and see how they experience those feelings. Right. And just to see how available those feelings are, because we need the full repertoire yeah. of emotion, right, to be healthy. Um, so I want them to be having them in the room with me. Right. And then I'll well, start... So you're, what you're saying is you'd purposely try and make them angry or you talk about things which might inspire might... anger yeah right okay so you so know how's work delve... how's the journey right. here and was really frustrating. Oh, right okay so the train didn't come so what happened to you oh, i didn't care mm. you didn't care that the train didn't come so when you got to work and your boss said to you you're late again you know what happened then oh i don't know i didn't care so there's anger and shame right right, right there what did you do before you got to work oh i don't know i hesitated a bit i got something to oh there's fear there as well okay so we've already got fear of the confrontation anger repressed shame when the boss says you're late again and you don't do anything so i'm sitting there thinking okay all these feelings now i want to know about your mum and your dad right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i always say i'm really sorry this is a typical therapist question yeah okay and they're like oh typical therapist question what's that gonna be can you tell me about your childhood sorry but i just want to know your ingredients it does all lead back to yeah the way we're brought up you know how the, the relationships we had with each parent yeah 
and older siblings. Yeah. And any other significant not young, Not younger siblings? No, I'm less interested. I would like to know about older si siblings evolving upwards. Yeah. Um, where are we looking? And generally speaking, you know, if you're looking at yourself or if you're looking at application into the world. So the social anxiety stuff, for example, for you, I'd be thinking, gosh, I wonder what his relationship with his mum was like. <laughs> 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 I've been waiting for you, Mr. Bond. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So because social application, um, one of the areas that I really want to look at is opposite gender parent or sibling. So, so for a woman, it most likely be the relationship male. with the dad and yeah. mom. Yeah. So, I mean, I and I will say, I'll, I'll say to them, look, I'm working with you. I'm going to ask you things. I can speculate. By all means, tell me if I'm barking up the wrong tree. Yeah. You know, I just want to. And what I want to do is to give permission to brainstorm. Because people feel like they've got to get something right. Um, or if if they say something that I'm busy going, yeah, interesting, write that down, you know. So tent pegs are going in, you know, all the way around. And and, the, and that's where the tent will be. Mm. And I'm just like, I'm not putting tent pegs in. Just brainstorm and uh, see what comes up. And uh, And we can discard stuff if you don't feel it next week. But at least we've looked at it. So let's just look at everything. Um, and I use analogies like, uh, you know, when people come into therapy, sadly, people don't come in when they're thinking, hmm, this could be a problem. That's the moment that they move house, change jobs, cut their hair, break up from the relationship, right. go on a diet, take up eggs. You know, they do everything else. And then they go, maybe I should see a therapist. <laughs> Ooh, it's something. true. Why do we do those things where... <laughs> You have drastic hair changes, something drastic that changed to think, yeah. you know, that's going to make me feel better. Yeah. I, what, what is that? What is that? I think it's, I think on, a de on, a, on its like core basis. I don't know. I think therapy is seen as, you know, the person who gets to set, sent to therapy from a family is clearly the problem. Yeah. You know? Whereas I think the one who goes to therapy is the one who's looking for a solution. Mm. Now we've got to tackle your family, right? You don't even want to come in the room. <laughs> which reflects a bit my own personal experience with my family. But so, yeah, I, I mean, people don't come in, I think, because they think it means that they need help, which means that they're stuck, which is probably, you know, I should be able to sort myself out. I don't want to tell a stranger my deepest and darkest. I don't want some stranger poking around telling me what to do. Mm. I mean, I identify with all of that. Um, Actually, it's not that bad, all the denial stuff. That only happens when I'm with so-and-so. It's not, you know, and you, you brush it under the carpet. And some people will brush it under the carpet and then displace it onto their partner. You know, yes, I'm always drunk, but you're so impatient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think it's hard. And I think that people coming into therapy or people bringing their kids into therapy, massively brave move. You know, as a parent, you bring your child in and you look at the therapist and I imagine you're thinking, gosh, that therapist thinks that I did this. Whereas I'm sitting there going, you're amazing. Well done. How incredible to let eyes on to your child, knowing that you've had a hand in this. I mean, that's so brave. Mm. So I think it's a brave move. I think it's an act of self-love. I think it's an act of hope. I think it's... Um, I mean, I have so much admiration for people who come in and sit opposite me and say, help me, let me tell you something, mm. you know. Uh, so I will say to them, listen, I'm never going to solve it for you. I'm going to sit beside you. We're going to brainstorm. Let's just look at everything. I'm not sticking everything down. You know, it's a bit like by the time you've come in here, you've got a drain pipe, right? It's got all your thoughts and feelings stuck in it. Mm. And the water's stopped flowing through. So you said, oh, I need to do something about this. So I'm going to turn up and I'm going to rod it from this end, <laughs> right? So poke from this end and something's going to pop out the other end and it's going to stink yeah. because it's been in there rotting and, mm. you know, changing for however long it's been there. So this isn't the truth. So don't think when it pops out that I'm going, oh, because I'm not. This isn't the truth. It's a distorted truth because it's been covered with shame and fear and secrecy and all of those things. So what we're going to do is going to let it air a bit, going to sort of pull it apart a bit, let it 
have a look. And then we're going to rod another and see if there's any themes or any patterns. Yeah. Um, and then link. Yeah, just, and... just have a look at it. And then sort of put it out on a sheet and move it around and see what's useful and see what you want to discard. And, you know, make your puzzle. Put your jigsaw pieces together. Mm. So what is the, what would you say is the aim of therapy? Um, and, you know, what, what are your goals when you have a, you know, a patient, client, client yeah. you know, come in and say, you know, I'm experiencing maybe these symptoms of certain things. What's the, the I want goal? you to feel comfortable in your own skin. I want you in your own shoes. It's your life. You need to be able to make whatever decision you want um, and live with the consequences. I want you to trust yourself. It doesn't matter if you trust the other person or not. Mm. You need to be able to trust yourself to be able to survive or thrive, yeah. whatever life brings to you. Um, so it is that investment in yourself. It's your relationship with yourself um, that's honest, um, open, so you're comfortable in your skin. Yeah. Free, dare I say. Yeah. I'm that's a big the, advocate the ideal of freedom. State. Yeah, that's the ideal state, isn't it? So, Manny, what is trauma? Mm. Well. Because we, we hear this word. Yeah. You know, people are talking about it more, I feel. You know, on social media, you hear people talking about trauma and these things that happen to us in our childhood. What is it? How, how do we identify a trauma? And what happens to our bodies when we experience trauma? Well, I think um, in its simplest form, trauma is an unexpected disturbance um, with, I mean, the word trauma, the implication is negative consequence. Uh, that's it, really. So whether that's... Um, it is a trauma to step out on the street and then step back and almost be hit by a car, for example, but not get hit. That would be a traumatic moment. You wouldn't log it as trauma, but I suppose what I'm saying is that it is any disturbance with negative consequence that interrupts, unexpected interrupts. Um, the sort of therapeutic stuff, uh, they call it big T and little t, yep. which is kind of interesting, really to measure trauma, because that could be quite shaming. Yeah. Um, it could also mean, oh, you've got a big T trauma. You know, that's a real life sentence. So I sort of move away oh. from those measures. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, when I read up on big T and little t, obviously little t is the, the, the trauma experiences that are like maybe daily stresses, your parents a bit, you know, hard on you and that sort of, sort of thing. And a lot of these little t's, were, you know, resulted in me having those anxious symptoms later on in life. But these were things were crippling. Yes. So how dare you call this a little T where, I've, you know, I've experienced something that's crippled my, my whole existence and yes. my life, you know. So I, I understand trauma. that. Um, and if you have a big T trauma, right, um, then you could walk into any room and trump the room mm. with your story. And how isolating is that? Yeah. So I know it's not a popular thing and I know we have to measure and I get all of that, but I do try to avoid those kinds of measures and just ask someone not to compare, um, but just to evaluate their own experience. Just, you know, let's have a look at what, what happened to you. And I think that the impact, the negative impact of trauma is how it's um, dealt with immediately afterwards. Mm. because people can have disturbing events in their lives, but if they're able to process them, reassured, understanding, if there's a place for you to sort of file it uh, and not project it outwards onto the world or inwards onto your self, like your self-worth, so you don't have to adapt around it, you mm. can simply know it for what it is, that has significantly less impact on somebody's 
you know, ongoing life. So I think it's, again, it's about how, what happens immediately after the trauma, whether it's recognised, reassured, how it's handled, how it's filed. And so when you're talking about your experience of little t trauma, that's just this kind of constant erosion, like Japanese water torture. Literally, you know, yeah. Um, then it's going to, you're not having it recognised. So you're trying to internalise it yep. as normal or as part of you, or and you're trying to figure out, is this me? Have I done this? And yep. all that questioning that goes on, which is mm. going to create a fear-based, shame-based, yep. um, anxious style of attachment, of experience in the world, mm. which you then internalise as I am anxious, you know, yep. really own it. And then yeah. people take medication, I take this medication because I am anxious, you know. I can't go out at this time because I am anxious. And now suddenly this thing's ruining your life. Anyway, go on that way. Yeah. So trauma, trauma is a disturbance, but the stuff we really got to look at is um, how it was managed, how it was handled. Because if somebody talks to me about a trauma in the room, in the therapeutic environment, um, I'll be very careful about even friends and things uh, or clients is I will immediately sort of look at the clock and think, have I got time to contain whatever comes up? So I don't want somebody to do the doorknob syndrome on me right. and be telling me something at 5 to the hour, and I know that they're going to leave re-traumatised. Yeah. Right? Because they've set me up to um, fail and for them to fail as well. Mm. Oh, I, I felt terrible leaving the last session. I, d I don't want to uh, discuss that again. Well, no, it wasn't that. It's that you brought it at 5 to. So let's have a look at that. Do you not think we can contain this? What are you worried about? What happened to you? I don't want to hear about the thing. What happened to you after the thing? Because that's what they're replicating. Yeah. So it's really looking at the whole experience for the person. Um, can they trust? Probably not. Um, paying someone to trust is easier because there's a contractual obligation. Right? And it's a one-way street. Mm -hmm. Trusting a friend or something, people end up very nervous after disclosing something. Anyway, lots about it, but thinking about uh, the response to the traumatic disclosure or the experience, I think, is the first place. 100%. To consider. Yeah, you know, and that's what every trauma specialist that I've spoken to along this journey of creating this documentary, it's that is the trauma itself is how it was processed mm -hmm. afterwards. You know, if, if somebody, if two people experience the same thing, but the, the, the first person, you know, had their parents to give them a hug and, yeah. you know, uh, assure them and all that sort of stuff. But the second person didn't, that person's going to be more affected, yeah. more likely than the person that didn't have that. Yes. And it's, um, so it's, sometimes it's not necessarily the, the thing that happened, it's how it was dealt with afterwards as well. Yeah, I mean, just soothing the parasympathetic nervous system. Just, you know, just stabilise. It's okay. Mm. It's okay. And we all do it. You know, you have a row with somebody. You uh, get upset about something. You feel misunderstood about something. You feel, and you have that surge of adrenaline and outrage and fear and shame and all those things. And being able to talk to somebody calming when those things happen, just, oh, it's okay. So all those maladaptive responses don't have to be mobilized. Those parts don't have to get involved. Mm. And you can just, it's actually okay. And that's just, you know, that's part of what I do and it's part of what how I live. Is actually, it's okay. Mm. We're all right. So person comes to you for therapy, I mean, is, would you say part of the goal is to, to process that trauma? Uh, it's an interesting one. So I, I was thinking about this a lot recently, process. When you say process the trauma, this may be the sorts of clients that I've been working with over the last few months, but there's a, there's a big emphasis on understanding. And yes, you need to understand your trauma or the responses and the process, but if you leave the feelings behind, ain't going to work. You will end up with somebody who intellectualizes an approach mm. but doesn't actually uh, feel comfortable in their skin. Yeah. So they can talk about it, you know, but, but they are still, you know, taught, slightly dissociated, probably still very controlling mm. in certain ways, intimacy avoidant, 
um, provocative, all these kinds of patterns of displacement. Um, so I've come up with a term, which is I want you to be buoyant with your experiences. You don't have to understand them right now. Um, and I was working with somebody and they said to me, you know, I'm sharing with you, Mandy, and I feel like I've just taken, you know, a chink out of the dam and the water's coming in, you know, and I'm like, OK, and I'm thinking about that. And then you, Mandy, go poke other holes and the water's really coming in now. Um, you know, don't don't poke the holes. And my answer was, but what makes you think you can't swim? Mm. You know, what makes you think you can't? I, I, because the desire is I want to process this one and put it in the box. And I want to process this one and I want to put it in a box. But what I would really like to help you to do is to believe in your ability to swim. Mm. You have already survived. You're not under threat. You have already survived. Trust yourself. Let the water come in. Let me help you to be buoyant. You don't have to understand all of it. There is nothing to run from. And all this stuff intermixes anyway. So let's just sit with the whole experience and see what that's like. Teach you to be buoyant with your stuff yeah. in your life. And then bit by bit, you know, let's look at it. Yeah. But there's nothing to run from. The first thing I want to do is to teach you trust yourself and to swim. Would you say that that takes some sort of like being uh, conscious of it? So, you know, let's say something happens and you feel a bit like anxious. Those, you know, those, those feelings come up. Um, oh, I've lost my train of thought. There are words like people talk about being triggered. Yeah. I'm more interested in the word activated. Yeah. Triggered makes me think you triggered me, right? So half of me is going, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you yeah. did that to me. Yeah. So I'll handle the bit that I'm, yeah, but I've, I've got an eye on you as well as triggering me, right? So I'm yeah. not taking, but if I go, I'm activated, then some, it, it's me. It's all me. And uh, once I realize that, and I'm curious about that, and I want to take responsibility for that. So I suppose the first thing I should say is I need to check that my client is a safe pair of hands for their stuff to come in. So I'm looking at their self-care, their sleep, their eating, their day-to-day -day lives. What's going on in your day-to-day -day life? And are you able, are you a trustworthy pair of hands for your memories and your history to return to? And if you're drinking, you know, alcoholically, then no, you're not a safe pair of hands. Mm. So I'm not going to start to talk to you about your trauma. Um, not unless it's causing you to, to relapse. Difficult call. But um, generally speaking, I want you to be a safe pair of hands for your memories to come visiting, for these parts of you to come back right. and to talk to you. So the first work is, how are you in your day-to-day -day life? How do you treat yourself? How do you talk to yourself? So when you get into the shower in the morning, do you sort of go, yay, <laughs> another day, you know, and on with the cold shower, because that's good for me, you know. I'm kidding. <laughs> do, you, do you do that, or do you get in the shower and just go, oh my God, I'm so disgusting, I'm so fat, I'm so, oh, yeah, oh, you know. Because if you're doing that, you're beating yourself up. You're not ready to do the trauma work. Okay, yeah. we need to do the shame stuff first, really put you in touch with how you're talking to yourself, get you to a place of good self-care. And that's why with addiction treatment, we say abstinence is one of the 12 things I'm going to ask you to do. But abstinence, I'm interested in. So if you came in with social anxiety, we'd probably... <laughs> In the first few sessions, you'd come in with one problem. By the time you left, you'd probably leave with 10. <laughs> because you'd have Unravel ways. Unravel certain things. Yeah, because it would be like... with certain situations. Coping with your social anxiety. Yeah. So now we'd be looking at your eating and your relationships, your yeah. dependency and your alcohol and da 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 well, With social anxiety, for me, because I had a, an issue with being able to express myself and talk to people and overanalyzing and stuff... You know, either smoking weed or drinking alcohol were the two things that actually calmed me. And I was able to, you know, 
what I felt I was being more myself when I had yeah. when I was intoxicated because I was able to express myself and talk and do all of these things. Yeah. Um, you know, and then it becomes a vicious cycle. And then I'm hungover during the week and I, you know, I'm taking two or three days to to, you know, to recover. Yeah. And that's making me feel even worse because I'm, you know, hungover and it's just that that ongoing cycle. It's a spiral that can kind of go on and on and on. Yeah. And every every time you use weed to um self medicate, the message you're giving yourself silently is I'm not good enough or I can't cope with me or I shouldn't have this feeling. Mm. So it's an assault on your self-esteem. Yeah. So the difficulty is it's, you know, I mean, all therapy sessions come down to love, right? The, the hippie in me loves that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but everything it's comes all about back. love. <laughs> it is all about love. It's about self-love. It is it's all about and... your love, yeah about love it's about unconditional love yeah. it's you know it does this is where we get to and that's what that basis of you know the relationship with your parents yeah that's your first point of love yeah you know, your that, experience of that love. first experience of love yes you know did my parents accept me for who i was or did yeah. they you know did they require me to be a certain way in yeah. order to give that love yes and that's where i felt like within my life i was somebody who was always you know, top at sports, winning things. And, and that's where I got my, you know, well done, Tan, and you yes. know, trying to keep, be that person. And what I found is that I wasn't being my authentic self all the time. I was trying to be this character, this loud character, this person who's always winning things. And, you know, when you strip that back, who am I? Yeah. You know, who, who am I? And I think that's where later on I was socially anxious because i couldn't be my true self overthinking things is it, how does this person think i am you know what do they think of me am i going to say the wrong thing oh they can look at they're looking at me and I'm, they're thinking that i'm anxious and you know being that hyper vigilant mm. kind of self it's that's a life under pressure yeah Con it was constant literally constant and my dreams like yourself growing up i wanted to be an actor and I wanted to be in front of the camera and I was I was a very confident child and and um yeah my 20s early 20s that kind of the anxiety kicked in or the fear kicked in the shame all of that sort of stuff and then I was un unable to be in front of the camera right. which is why I started doing right. the directing and being behind the camera and all that sort of stuff because I wanted to be involved in that but I couldn't be in front of that camera I couldn't be myself. You know? What happened was, to you when you're in front of the camera? So I, uh, my mind would go blank. Right. So you know, just before when I said my yes. mind went, yeah, yeah, lost your thought. That th that would happen. So and you that wouldn't was trust that. yourself. It was a, almost like a panic. Yeah. Or an overthinking about. So as I'm talking, I'm not really engaged in what I'm talking about. I'm more. I'm. I can see everything. I'm like it's almost like a focus. It's like a dissociation that happens where I just kind of like zone out and then my mind goes blank. And then I'm, as I'm talking, I'm forgetting what I've just spoken about yeah. or what we just done, you know? Um, yeah. And that, that, that's what would happen in front of the camera, in groups of people. You know, I had a, uh, an anxiety attack where I was a, um, I was in working in retail and I was a supervisor and I do staff trainings. So this would be in front of people. And I, I never had a problem doing it. Um, and this one time, I I think I was in competition with another supervisor. We'd both been promoted. And it was almost like the pressure of that. And uh, I was doing the staff training. And my mind went blank. Literally, like I couldn't, like I was hyper vigilant. I could see everyone looking at me. Couldn't remember what I was talking about or what I what needed to say, um, and I froze. And it was this like feeling, you know, of embarrassment, eyes on me, my heart's going, um, and then I just ran off the shop floor. That was the only right. thing I could do. Was like, you know, embarrassed, ran so off the what, shop floor. So, what had been your experience of failing in your childhood? Where had you learned how to fail? See, the thing is, when I was a child, I would win everything. You never learned to, to fail? To the, to the extent of, uh, you know, 
uh, musical chairs mm-hmm. at people's parties. I'd win every single one. I'd cheat sometimes, and but I had to win. Yeah, cheers, uh, yeah. Sports games, I'd be, you know, top at sports, the fastest in my year, winning all these sports awards. Um, you know, I was even top of some, you know, uh, classes. I was good at maths. I was in set one. I'd get always. Um, and the real turning point was when around the time my parents got a divorce when I was 17 and uh, I stopped studying. So I went into A-levels and I failed. That was my first time of being like, right, I'm a fake. Like, my life's not going the direction I thought it would. I thought I'd go to university and all that sort of stuff. And I failed. I wanted to redo the year and it didn't happen. And yeah, it just kind of went downhill from then. And that, that's when I started using drugs when I was 17 because of this awful experience in my life. My parents, my stability, my home was broken. And I think it, I think it was from then. Have you, did you see the divorce coming? To an extent, but I didn't think it would ha- like really happen. My parents were arguing during that time, but I didn't think it would really happen. How did you find out? I think my parents sat us down, me and my sister. It's really interesting that you sit there and go, I think. You know, I'm like yeah. it's a moment that you're unsure either of talking about or of um, clear memory. I hadn't thought about it for a while. And then, yeah. But you- yeah, I think there's definitely a part of not wanting to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, fair enough. Yeah. And would you attribute your A-level failures to a divorce? I feel that that had a big part of it because it was when I was 17, it was just chaos. Mm. You know, dad didn't move out straight away, you know, stayed in, a, in the box room for a bit. Just started driving, started going out, drinking. Mm. Was working with friends who would after we go back and we take drugs mm. and sometimes all night and then go back to work the mm. next day. It was, but I was able to do this. My dad was quite, not strict, but he would, you know, he wouldn't allow that to happen if I was living with him but because he left. My mum, you know, I'm bigger than my mum. I could outvoice my mum if I wanted to. I, you know, didn't take her shit. Well, didn't take it. That's the wrong way to word it. She, I was giving her yeah, shit. Yeah, you dropped into a teenage state then. Just, yeah, literally. <laughs> How do you feel at this moment? How are you feeling um, like right now? Do you know? I've not really spoken about this much. And so it's, it's, quite, it's nice It's a nice actually to get it off the, my chest. But Do you know how you feel? How do I feel? Mm. I'm not sure. I don't have any like sensations. I really hear Still how hurt. you can... Ah, uh, now, hurt. can you feel it? Yeah, there's like a tightening in the chest. Okay. Because, you know, talking about something like you say, I, it's good to get it off my chest. But not allowing the feelings to stay connected to it means that you're purging the experience, but the feelings are sitting here, mm. still sitting in here. And the therapeutic opportunity is to be able to talk about something and then allow the feelings to connect to it. Yeah. Not so that you get rid of the experience, but so that you digest it. Yeah. You want to digest those two parts together. And I really hear how your experience of failure, which was yours, was connected to the divorce. So this really wasn't you failing. This was you failing because your container broke. Mm. And as a, as a result of the container breaking, you became boundaryless. Yeah. Right. So we've gone Literally. into the sort of all or nothing response. You've gone into all yeah. indulgence and neglect, all that stuff. Um, and so I imagine, again, this really isn't an experience of failure. Not really. This is a consequence of the divorce. So it's going to have resentment around it. Yeah. Hurt, blame, all of those things, which is probably why just now when you went into, you know, big enough to take my mum's shit. You were in a little teenage moment there <laughs> yeah. where it's like, take yeah, mum's yeah. shit. And then you go, whoa, well, you know. And my adult stepped in like, Where, where did I... that come from? Yeah. yeah. And it's when you're in therapy, if we were in therapy and talking about this, it would be to just try and go back and, and to listen to what you've just said. 
to try and bear witness to your own experience, really hear those parts, um, allow the feelings. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't sound like your first experience of failure. So when you're talking about being in front of the camera mm. and failing, I'm wondering, you know, where you learn that because you're now going to be looking at that experience and having fear of failure. Mm. And if you're frightened of failing, then you're really in trouble because you've got both the fear. That's, that's, uh, that's, and that's when I've not thought about it that before. That it's literally all been a fear of failure, yes. fear of like not performing for the camera or, yeah. or you know, yeah, failing. That's what being it is. The, being the version of you that people expect or that you expect of yourself. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And that's going to make you just want to withdraw yeah. and hide. And that's what I did for, yeah. for a lot of the time. Hibernated, yeah. wouldn't go out. Or if we did, it, we'd have to go out to do drugs or party and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I'll, then be I'll, that able person. To, so I'll be the I'll yeah. be that person. Yeah. I'll be the stoned version. I'll yeah. be the drunk version. Yeah, yeah. I'll be the womanizer or whatever I, it is. I'm, yeah, and that as well. Yeah. And I'd, I'd even remember going, you know, we go out to a rave and everybody get in the cab and everyone's talking and, and I would not talk. I'd be sitting there in silence until. I did my first bit of... Two pills down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, then, and then I'd be, you know, yeah. Ton, who I know I am really deep down. Yeah. I am an enthusiastic person. I am quite... I've always been quite a passionate person. But, yeah, I suppose it's the fear of failure. So it's so. the feeling about the experience. It's not the experience. Yeah. And we need to be looking at what is your um, perception, what's your judgment of that feeling or of that experience, because that's where the trouble will lie. Yeah. You know, that's where I'm resistant or I'm afraid of. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's possible. I mean, I've stood in a conference delivering my own model, right, that I've written and forgot it. I was standing there and I went, I've forgotten another core characteristic. And somebody called out from the audience and they went, it's shame. And I said, brilliant. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. And I carried on. And she came up to me afterwards and said, didn't you feel any shame? And I was like, no, actually, genuinely, no. I'm delighted that you knew what it was. And I carried on. I just, I think I know I'm flawed. See, that for me would be my ideal state. And I think that's what, to that's know you're such flawed. A, n no, yeah. no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no. To be, yeah, to not have that shame. To be, because I think that's the most powerful position someone could be in. Yeah, maybe. And I think it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is to be in that not caring. And I'd like to think I say that I don't care. It's not about I, not caring. It's about caring enough about myself that I'm allowed to make mistakes. Right. Ooh. You know, I'm allowed. I'm allowed. Again, I was talking to somebody, a client recently, and they were talking about um, the concept of a therapist as knowing it all, you know, on a high, on a pedestal, like, um, you know, just... Do, do you ever feel yourself getting into that, um, not like a, yeah, kind of ego mode of... Uh, That's not me, on a pedestal, mm, knowing everything. Yeah. I'm very human. Yeah, no, but I'm saying, <laughs> do you ever feel yourself slipping into sort of ego mode at all? Um, ego mode. What? Yeah, so, I'm trying to, I helped I you, of, I'm better than you type thing. Yeah, but not, but, not, but, not, but, not, but, no. not, but not purposely or like... No, you know. I really don't. If I've done some good work, I'll come out of a session, I'll be like, I love my job. Yeah. I love my job. Because my nemesis is addiction, Yeah. Right. That's like... You're fighting it, yeah. You know, and and thank you for bringing it in here. Let's another little yeah. seed's been out of the world. Amazing. What you want to do with your life is up to you. Um, do I get a buzz out of helping people? I like, I like giving. I like giving. Um, but it is unconditional. I mean, I've given a lot to people and I've been given you know, not very nice things back sometimes. And I sort of look at it and I think in myself, do I regret giving you what I gave you, given that you've just given me back distrust or abuse or mm. whatever it might be? Uh, and I just think, no, I'm happy to have given that. And I look at the other person and just think it's really sad that you weren't able to receive this in the spirit it was given and you had to sort of throw something back in my face. Yeah. Um, but then do you look at it and go, 
I know where that's come from. Probably. Yeah. I'll probably look and think, I wonder where that's coming from. Right. And I'll think, and then I'll go to, because this is, because I came into therapy via treatment, mm. you know, via being, you know, a nightmare, apparently. I mean, I took coke to feel comfortable with everyone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, three years into recovery, my friends started saying, no, we were terrified of you when you were taking Really? <laughs> I, no, really? Yeah. I, I did it. To, you know, when I used to go and do school talks, I would stand in front of a bunch of school kids, you know, several years clean down the line, and I would say, do you know what? I think um, I'm probably terrifying on Coke, few drinks on board, and a man in my sights. Yeah. And there would be a titter across the sort of I thing. I can't imagine you and on I Coke. Think, <laughs> I don't want to imagine you on Coke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh God, anything was possible. I mean, just, yeah, I mean, you'd end up in other countries really, from a yeah. night out. I mean, it was, let's do this. But you're in showbiz as well. You're in, you're in TV. Yeah, I was. I, I want to talk a bit more about that. Do you? Yeah. Mm. I want to talk about more of your experiences. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily that time, but yeah. I mean, you had your Channel 5 show oh, in yeah. therapy with, and, mm. you know, you did therapy sessions with people like Callum Best. I mean, the thing is, you were just saying to me, you know, does it feed the ego? It's really interesting because, yeah. I mean, I'm really, I, I don't think so. I do not see myself, in, I, I enjoy what I do, and it really is unconditional. And mm. if I need you to get well as a result of the help I give, then I own your recovery and I don't want to do that. I just want the opportunity to be myself. Right. And um, so when I got um, approached around doing the television stuff, I, my first fear was, oh, my God, I know television. I don't want to do this. You know? I don't want the lack of anonymity. How, how did it come about? Uh, how did it come about? I met an agent and uh, they, they said that very quickly after I met this agent, they brought it forward. I, we had a conversation about it. They brought it forward and said, this is going on. Um, John Noel Management, lovely man. And uh, I had a yeah, very nice uh, agent there. Anyway, the program came through and I was thinking, I can't do this. Um, I'll lose my anonymity, going to be scrutinised. Mm. It won't be sincere, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And my husband at the time, who's a lighting cameraman, he said, listen, you know, if you can't do it now, when can you do it? I was like, okay. And then uh, he said, and if you don't do it, somebody else will do it their way. And I thought, okay. So I went to the agent and I said, if we're in the therapy room, when the door's shut, it's therapy. It's therapy. And they're like, great. And I remember with Callum Best, I remember him saying to me, um, you know, checking that out, basically. Have we got what my agent has said we can and can't talk about? And, and my response was, well, look, this is therapy. I am a therapist. I'm not doing this for anything other. My reason for doing this is because I want to show what therapy could look like to the masses. I want people to see, oh, okay. You know, it can just be a conversation, an alliance, a collaboration. It can be a discovery. It doesn't have to be, you know, directive and all of those things. Um, and so that was my boundary. I was like, I want this to be really honest and I want it to be therapy. Mm. As far as you can do it with, you know, camera rigs and all those sorts of things. And of course, because I'd been married to a lighting cameraman, I was just immune to the cameras. Yeah. You know, we've had rigs up in our house. We've had crew coming in and out at all times. Just like again. your back your back bedroom, you know, your, yeah, your living so, room, sorry. You know, yeah, when I remember, you know, there'd be a new show and there'd be a new camera being used or a rig being used on the show. So the whole house would be rigged with these cameras, you know, for a week whilst he was working out how it might all work. Yeah, yeah. And we'd all just be living there. So, yeah, I mean, you know, put a camera in my face and I don't blink. Mm. So, so what, was it, what was it like with Callum Best? So he's, he was, after you told him, no, I'm doing the therapy, well, then what happened? Yeah, we had a couple of run-ins, me and Callum. We did. <laughs> did you? Yeah, we did. Had a couple of little um, tussles. Um, yeah. I mean, those sessions, some people were really adapted and polished and wanting to maintain the facade. And other people really opened themselves up to the experience and allowed something to happen. Mm. 
And uh, some of those people I know have carried on the work mm. with sincerity and really followed through on the opportunity of change. And hats off to them, mm. to be honest. So uh, I think some of the people who came in really took it as a starting point to Good. do something different with their lives, and which is great. But what, I really, you as well. but what I really got from it was I would we would come in after um, the programme had been aired and my PA, Karen, would ring me up and say, oh, we've got 200 calls on the answer machine, you know, and they're all from people needing help, but there's very little money. Mm. And what are we going to do? So we put together these help lists of all the free stuff. I'm constantly promoting the fellowships, you know, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Codependence Anonymous, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. I know it's a pejorative sounding name and everybody hears Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous and thinks everybody's in there shagging and that it's all about too much sex. It's not. It's about attachment and intimacy. It's about how you experience relationships, intensity, obsession, you know, avoiding commitment, blah, 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 all that stuff, right? So, but there are these free fellowships worldwide, all time of day and night, and now on Zoom, that are a free support for you to explore yourself with a mentor and follow a structured 12-step program. And so we just went, right, here's a help list for all these people who call in after the show. Amazing. Um, here are some local services in the various areas, and we would just send them out. We got somebody in to man the phones and to send out all of that to people who wanted to follow up. Amazing. Yeah. And people can still do that now, right? Yeah, of course they can. I mean, always, if I can, always just my first comment, I mean, when I used to do this morning and, uh, you know, I would often talk to people and it would be, there's no addiction here. And at the end of the call, I would always be going, yeah, okay, I know you think there's no addiction here, but please just go to Coda. Just go to Al-Anon, which is the family members one. Just, just have a look at, um, you know, Sex and Love It's Anonymous. I know it's an awful name, but just go take a look because that's about your relationship with yourself. That's the thing. And really try to help people to access free unbelievable and meaningful support amazing to think about yourself in fellowship with other people who are doing the same thing yeah i mean really brilliant amazing so yeah i can imagine you know some people may think oh i'm doing it with other people i don't want to share my experiences with other people and stuff so sit and listen because mm. that's the beauty of group therapy or fellowships you don't have to talk you don't have to talk and you know if you're sitting there with people who are talking honestly because they're further down the line and they trust the room one day you'll be sitting in that room and you'll hear your story mm. and you'll know that somebody has walked this path and got well and that moment fractures the isolation just dispels with the shame and suddenly there's a moment of hope of well actually maybe i'm not special and different maybe maybe i can get well and it's not about how much you drink or have i really got a drug problem or blah blah blah, blah. don't worry about any of that i knew a kid years ago who smoked weed once a week right once a week and he was an addict mm -hmm. because the first two days of the week he was obsessing about getting it. On the yeah. third day, he would smoke it. Then he would go into fantasy. It would trigger his slar, to be fair, but then he would go into fantasy. By Friday, he was going into withdrawal. And by Monday, he's plotting it again. Yeah, you know, yeah. The whole week. So he doesn't have a problem because he does it once a once week. Once a week. Yeah. So going into something like Narcotics Anonymous and saying, I smoke two spliffs a week is, I'm not bad enough. You know, mm. don't worry about any of that. Yeah. It's not about how much you drink or use or any of that. It's just, that's just a misnomer. It's about whether you want to get well. Can this be your rock bottom? Is this your point of saying, I'm worth more? That's all you've got to think. How does somebody reach out to these fellowships? Is look online like, yeah. and you look for Alcoholics Anonymous, Codependence Anonymous, Codependency being the compulsive caretaking, people pleasing, yeah. being somebody's rock, yeah. confidant, all that stuff comes from childhood. Um, very painful place actually, because it's self neglect. Um, you know, eat, all the eating disorders fellowships. So Anorexic Bulimics Anonymous, ABA, um, OA, Overeaters Anonymous, which is the main generic uh, fellowship. There is a fellowship for pretty much any of the addictive disorders. Um, 
and Adult Child of the Alcoholics, ACA. Powerful fellowship, not about getting clean. It's about looking at your childhood. Mm. Um, so these fellowships are incredible and free. And you just look up online. It says find a meeting. You can go to a Zoom meeting. You can change your name in your little box. And you can just sit and listen. And you can go ahead and think about it. And you can come back to another one and listen. Um, Amazing. Because there's lo lots of people out there probably think, I can't afford yeah, therapy. Exactly. Or these therapy, you know, yeah. £100, £400 a session, yeah. whatever it is. But there is things out there that people can go and, and, and do. So there's no And excuse. then if you want to do therapy, so if you clean up through the rooms, for example, and you start to get some insight... So rather than information, which is, I understand this, you get insight. You go, I understand how this relates to me. Right? Yeah, yeah. So suddenly it's like, oh, my God, I am the common denominator in everything that's happened <laughs> yeah. in my life. So in that moment, it's like, oh, oh shit. Yeah, yeah. And then it's, oh, brilliant. Yeah. Because if I'm the common denominator. I can do something about it. I can do something about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, so whether that is an addiction, whether that is something that is anxious or a depressive presentation, whether that's the knowledge that you had trauma in your background, in your childhood, and you don't want to go there because yeah. the whole thing scares you. And you know what? I don't want to go there. I left that behind and I really don't want to be talking about that with anyone. It's like, mm. okay, don't. That's too big a puddle for you to go right into the middle and talk about that. So let's just mop it up from the edges and let's make the puddle smaller. Mm. Let's make it a bit more manageable. And then when you know how to talk about yourself, choose yourself a therapist and go in and target something. Yeah. And then go back to the rooms for recalibration and to be buoyant with your stuff. And then and you go back in. Yeah. I like buoyant. I'm going to use that. I'm going to take buoyant. that away. I like buoyant. <laughs> yeah, because it's, yeah, it's not, it's, yeah. it's flexible. It's, you know, yeah. you can move, yeah. Just bobbing around with my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but the whole process, it's a bit, um, you know, it's a process of discovery and self-acceptance and ultimately self-love. That's what it's down to, you know? isn't it? Because if you do love yourself, you won't do things again and again that hurt you. Yeah. You just won't. And, you know, if you can have the self-discipline to practice self-care to be pretty forensic about what's going on for yourself then you're less likely to lie to yourself yeah if you can trust people around you your kind of core support network um to be honest with them about what's going on not so that they advise you but so that you can uh, yeah that's the truth that's what i was doing yeah um and just just you know don't be hard on yourself it's like, I'm flawed, I'm human, I'm going to be running into my stuff for the rest of my life. You know, it's never going to go away. Yeah. So be kind to it. And I think it's... 100%. And, and that's what you learn. That's what you learn in decent therapy. That's what you learn. Comfortable yeah. in your skin. I think everyone needs to do it, don't they? <laughs> yeah. To an extent. I'm safe to say everyone has been through something or has things that, maybe show up triggers whatever it is because of things that have happened to them in their life yeah that is affecting their life currently which they can do something about sure and once you do something about it you have a better quality of life yeah and you know i think therapy happens in conversations with friends and all that sort of stuff in a way it's a conversation you respect your friend you listen to their feedback so it's a sort of therapeutic experience um, but you just got to make sure that your friend isn't a narcissist or a codependent or something like that yeah. because they're going to tell you who you are. They're going to tell you that you're, well, a narcissist would um, literally take your inventory and tell you what's wrong with you. Um, so you're going to come away feeling very uncomfortable mm. um, and probably angry later. And the codependent is going to give you answers and fix you and give you advice. Yeah. Um, so you want to be around friends, plural, not just one best friend who knows everything, but yeah. friends. So that what you're doing is you're hearing your experience, a bit like in group. So you hear other people talking, you hear your experience without taking anybody hostage so that they align with your thinking and either people please you or abuse you. Um, mm. And you can get I mean, perspective. You, you mentioned uh, a narcissist, mm. and we had a, we had a chat about narcissists when we did the documentary. You're not on camera, but off camera, we spoke about. But it'd be interesting for you to to explain what a narcissist is and how they become a narcissist and and things because 
narcissists are labeled as you know narcissists the worst people in the world and well if you explain what they are <laughs> we can maybe elaborate a bit more on that but these are people that have been through stuff in their life you know yes they are i mean the there are what shall i say um measures of narcissism grad gradients of narcissism right and narcissism is a bit of a catchphrase nowadays um calling people narcissistic and so on but essentially when you're looking at narcissism you're looking at early wounding before somebody has the opportunity to really get a hold of who they are as a person like your original self and so they will maladapt into being needing to be better than to feel safe but the needing to be better than right which is the showing off uh overachieving um winning you know those kinds of uh, presentations are driven by a sensation of not good enough so there is a shame core to every narcissistic disorder um which drives this need to be charismatic and shiny and the one right the one because that's the safety so if the wounding is that early asking a narcissist to go back and explore that so from a place of superiority to put that down um willingly and consciously and explore the less la- less than will feel terrifying which is why sort of general speak says that you can't recover from narcissism because rarely mm. will you meet a narcissist who's willing to put down such a successful maladaptive facade yeah. and um codependency the um, sort of the empathetic empathetic end of addiction so the person who will put themselves out over forgive over give love because of the neglect they experienced in childhood is the perfect partner to the narcissist of course because they will overextend and forgive and understand that this maladaptive presentation comes from pain but the problem is that if the narcissist isn't attached to their pain then they're just acting out abusively Mm. so you have this knowledge i have this knowledge we have this knowledge that narcissism evolves from early wounding but the narcissist himself is dissociated from that fact and therefore will behave with entitlement yeah they will displace their stuff onto everyone else if they do something wrong it'll be your fault yeah if you knock over a glass of water right <laughs> and you're a narcissist down there you'll say why did i put it there but, yeah, 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 <laughs> it'll be yeah. my fault yeah yeah right because you cannot feel blame yeah or shame yeah. because it takes you back to a place that you cannot cope with which is why you've put on the better than maladaptive facade it's a trap it's yeah. an intimacy trap uh, really struggle to experience love they can love bomb they can show up for moments of yeah. love and intimacy and it's intoxicating to be around um but unless they want to address this unless they get tuned into wow this is my early trauma it's actually limiting m- who i can be how successful i can be um my relationship with myself if there is that glimpse then you can work with them yeah then you can work with them and yeah. help them understand very gently that this place of shame and blame and fear from early childhood that they've already survived it but mm. all that stuff will need to be heard or witnessed to and it's a hard thing to do from yeah. someone who doesn't who wants to sit here saying i'm you know and as a therapist you know. i'm going to be told why do you always do this and you're always arguing with me and why do you so i'm going to pick up some of the defenses and the displacement and the gaslighting um when the narcissist feels vulnerable because they've shown me something that they're terrified of mm. so yeah i mean long long work um you know and the first thing to do is to establish trust yeah which is difficult i'm guessing you've worked with narcissism yeah. and i mean a lot of people who are very successful in narcissist believe yeah, that yeah. there's a single minded yeah. ruthlessness 100% i do identify with a lot of the narcissistic traits i do feel like i've worked on a lot of them but i do find myself sometimes maybe slipping into narcissistic role as a as a means of protection yeah from somebody who maybe was always blamed for certain things as a child you know um 
So yeah, but there is a lot of shame behind that. I think um, it's remembering for you, remembering that when you go into that place of fueled, overfueled ego, arrogance, any of those things, it's to know that those are not personality traits. Yeah. To know that they're maladaptive defences and you're probably mm. frightened. Yeah. I think for me, the turning point of maybe acting and behaving better was under that understanding yeah. of where it came from. Yeah. And once you have that understanding, then you're able to then go, right, it's not just who I am, who I thought it yeah. was. You know, it's these are coming from a place of defense, trying to defend fear. and, you know, and fear, yeah. Yeah. Of um or maybe that person finding out that I'm not good enough or yeah. feeling, you know, having that feeling. Yeah, but it's, it's a very when... interesting one because you, you you can't say a, a narcissist, you know, a narcissist is in society these days. You can't say that a narcissist is somebody who's gone through stuff and treating them like a human being. They're seen as like the enemy and the yeah, person. Yeah, that guy, yeah. Which, I, I mean, I don't want to really empathize and empathize and, and and really expand on that too much. But yeah, it's, it's interesting when you understand where it comes from. But it's the same as anything. It's like um, an addict. You know, you could look at me in my full-blown coke addiction and go, gosh, she's in pain. But if I'm not in touch with that pain, yeah. I am a frigging nightmare, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. End of, full stop. Yeah. But and when I got into legend recovery, at the time doing it. <laughs> but when I got into recovery and I start to go, wow. Yeah. Okay, so now I've got, I've got an understanding. I'm starting to take responsibility for what drives it. Now I do deserve empathy. Now I do deserve compassion. Yeah. Because I'm taking responsibility, even if I continue to behave, you know, in a way that's not great. Um, as long as I'm aware of it and I'm making amends and I'm thinking about it, and I'm even if my amend isn't to say sorry to you, if my amend is to adjust my behavior, to learn, mm. you know, it's a living amend then I deserve the empathy and the compassion and the understanding. But no, to give somebody that sort of empathy whilst they are refusing to look at what drives it and living very entitled way, hurting other people with that sort of abuse, then they have to be held to account. And if they won't be, then the people around them need to be taught how to survive to protect themselves. Yeah. Because the narcissist will just be sealed into their own yeah. self-centered you know trauma response essentially yeah do you, do you find that narcissists were raised by narcissists is not that not necessarily is that, right um but it can happen for sure yeah not necessarily it's difficult because when you start hearing like if i'm speaking to someone who has a narcissistic wounding and they start i mean they're in therapy so they're already at a stage where they've had some self-reflection Although some people who I have gone on to work with have come in because of someone else, right? It's a classic gaslighting, <sighs> three phones, and they're like, well, I'm only here because, you know, I need you to see this person. I'm like, okay, that person's going to get referred to there. You're my client. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to sit between you and the door. How does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what was I going to say about that? I can't remember what I was going to say about that. Sort of thinking about how they come in. Are they raised by narcissists? When they talk about their parents, they're already talking about it through a lens of trying to understand. So how can I diagnose their parents if I don't meet them? Because mm. I'm hearing about their parents through the lens of, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. over-identification or justification or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, So you're not getting a real accurate no. representation of no, that. No, there's no litmus that. test of mum yeah. and dad. And you've got to understand that as a therapist that... Yeah, it's just coming from what yeah. they're saying about that person. Yeah, there's a so, lot I don't know. So you have to and sit on the okay. fence about certain things. Yeah, and... just like, well, if that's what you think, what does that allow you to do? Yeah. Where does that take you? If that's your point of reference, that's the evidence you're going from, how does that then impact you? Mm. You know, what do you do with that ingredient? Yeah. Yeah, so that's where it always comes back to. Therefore, you are what? Yeah. You know, <laughs> This it's so funny because there's always a meaning to to anything that somebody talks about, discusses. Oh, like if, there's an intention behind everything. Does your mind? Do you feel like your mind goes into overdrive when you're like talking to someone? Do you? I mean, do you piece these puzzles of? Uh, do you know what? Or I create think... an identity. <laughs> I, can, I imagine you as some like 
not like a <laughs> robot, but you know, having this. Oh, do you remember? Laser watching, thing. Do you remember Total Recall? When yeah, it comes like that. Goes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I imagine your brain doing when you're talking to someone. I have to turn it off. And actually, it's really interesting because as a therapist, I am a person yeah. and a therapist. Yeah. As a person, I'm really stripped naked because I'm not a therapist. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I switch that off. I'm really vulnerable in the right. real world because I haven't got the therapist part of me on board because I don't scan. So I make lots of mistakes. Mm. I, you know, don't read people in the way that I do in the room. So my sort of superpower, my place. You, know, you turn it on. Like, I'm a just, person and a therapist, yeah. but as a person, no. You're like Superman taking off his glasses. Yeah, and then He's I just... a normal man. No, I'm just like, yeah, exactly. You're just in the world. I know, I know. And, you know, that's, that's quite strange because then people say, well, you know, you're a therapist and there's this expectation. <sighs> Mm. of what I might do or what I might say or how I might behave or who I am. And I'm like, no, I mean, I'm just a person. Yeah. And, and, and that's really important to me to be allowed to have that space. I know you worked with Nikki Graham. Yeah. Who's somebody that, you know, we, a lot of us know through Big Brother and obviously she sadly recently yeah. passed because of, you know. Anorexia. Anorexia. Is there anything you can maybe share about your time working with her and... Hmm. She was a sweetheart. I mean, really, what a sweetheart. I mean, she was institutionalised, I think it was from 9 till 20 or 9 till 18, something like that. And she just had no uh, reference of what it was like to be in the world. Literally none. She was institutionalised. Yeah, in went from one institution to another, which is why Big Brother was just such a spot-on space for her because she was back into a contained environment she knew how to be in that space mm. absolutely knew how to be in that space the real world no um but yes i mean a really sweet generous um very insecure lovely person and i had the pleasure of seeing her outside of the times of the program and um the in therapy program had some contact with her outside of that too yeah, what a sweetheart. Mm. That was very sad. Yeah. That was. Some, you know, you can help to an extent. Um, yeah, I mean, it's complicated. Yeah. That was complicated. You know, anorexia is difficult because um, the sort of psychopathology of anorexia is finding safety and not needing. So if I don't need, you can't affect me. So once you're in that space of... Um, if I don't need you, can't affect me, then even one grape challenges your entire defence mechanism. Mm. If I now admit that I'm hungry at all, I need. And if I need, I'm vulnerable. So I'm now heavily invested in not needing at all. Mm. So when people say, but it's crazy, you know, why, why won't they eat something? Would this be going through th that person's mind? What is their logic to it kind of like the, i mean it's usually control so this is something i can control right but right. Are they, are they, do they generally understand that that's what they're doing Not they're they control. know they're trying to get control right they, that know, they that do know they feel out of control with something else mm. so whatever else is going on in their lives so they choose to control something which gives them a sense of control then they get this um heady feeling of not needing and that feels like power um and uh, it's very difficult then to need again. And that is socially, um, nutritionally, it's need, full stop. Mm. And then you end up with starvation affecting the brain. So how you think, how you feel, you're now in a state of starvation, you're not thinking straight. Um, really dangerous. It's really dangerous. And quite often if I'm working with someone who suffers from anorexia, I won't even talk about the food. We'll have a nutritionist working with that, just to be clear. Uh, but we will... Uh, for me, I'll be working with relational need. I want you to trust me. I want to form a relationship. I want to start thinking about how to access need from a different angle because you will be so defended from the food perspective. I won't win. I mean, you've made this your life, right, to control the food to that point and you'll negotiate, you know, something small and we'll spend two years negotiating over that. So I'm not going to do that. You can work with a nutritionist. I want to work with you in the relational arena yeah. and see if we can start to wake up any sense of need um, emotionally or relationally. 
So I like working with people. I'm very much a team worker. I'm yeah. very much, you know, work within a team, collaborate. Is this an approach that you were taught? No. <laughs> it was something that... Comes with me. Yeah. It comes with knowing that I'm Empathy. flawed. Yeah, knowing that I'm flawed, knowing I'm great at some things, but I want eyes on my back. There are other people who do other things really well. Yeah. So if we can all hold hands, then we've got a myriad view of the client and then we can give them a myriad view of their treatment plan. So they're not looking at me to save them. They're looking at me to do the bit I do and then someone else is working that side and their addiction can't keep eyes on everyone, mm. right? So you get a moment in and you can help someone to to uh, get up and get well. That's quite an unusual way for a therapist to work because uh, generally therapists, that's my client, that's my person I'm working with. Um, and I know you've had that experience. We've discussed that briefly. Yeah. But I also know that the way that you work because you introduced me to two other therapists, one of which is going to be in the documentary, yes. who is absolutely great, by the way, Kevin. He is. Um, I actually had a therapy session with him. He's uh, tremendous. Yeah. Very good at what he does. And we it's... work a lot together, he and I. Mm. And, you know, I haven't had a session with you, but we've obviously spoken. And it's it's amazing how you both generally would have similar goals, but you come at it from completely different angles, both of which are as effective. So, But together... Together, it's like a, a superhuman. <laughs> it's like um, Thanos with all of his... It's the Kevin Mandy show. Yeah. No, it's not. You it's... should do it. You should do it. <laughs> I mean, it, it's... Um, yeah, I mean, Kevin's really talented and he works directly with the feelings. And I tend to um, hold... I mean, it's my family of origin material, right? So I will hold and I've got capacity and I don't think anything really would shock me now. You know, I, you're not going to be too angry for me to hold. You're not going to tell me something. I, so I, I give, I think, this sort of sense of holding and being mm. able to work out what's going on and, and process and be buoyant with what's going on. Mm. And then I'll say, okay, you're now ready to do Kevin, come back and we'll see where you are. And then Kevin back, then maybe to Dita, and then maybe work with fear or something with Tyler will come into group. And then you'll do group for six months. And then it's like, okay, come back out, breathe, take some time off, come back in three months. How are you doing? Yeah, there's this, that person can do it. So looking at sort of people's real specialities, how they work with someone, how accessible that person is. Um, yeah, I love it's working It's amazing. With it's very tailored. Yeah, I love working with person. the team. Absolutely. And I think that's the way it should be. Yes, I think it should be too. Mm. And, you know, if I refer you to a therapist, so we're working together, and then I say, okay, you're ready, I'd like you to work with Kevin, and you come back, I don't like him. I'm like, why? Because <laughs> <laughs> that just tells what me volumes you? about you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, what's, what's, he, what's he tapped into well, that you didn't like? That, that you translate as you didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to tell someone they're translating. Somebody just has a feeling and it Great, it may I want to hear it yeah. because there's a clue. Yeah. You know, so everything's a clue. Amazing. On your journey back to yourself. Amazing. Yeah. Is there any, anything, anything any tips and tricks to, to life? Mm hmm that you have? I mean, that's very, it's a very broad question. Yeah. So I remember last time we spoke, and we were discussing boundaries and I, I can't remember exactly what we were talking about. It was, yeah. it was around sort of, you know, people maybe complimenting and trying to get things from you and you were discussing like how to put boundaries in place and all these sorts of things. I don't know. Well, don't be seduced. Yeah, well, that was one of them. But you know, the, Don't but be that, seduced because it, it represents a need inside you that you're not meeting. <laughs> I mean, I think... I think one of the things is to remember to ask yourself what's going on for me because, you know, we react and we don't respond. I'm guilty of it still today. You know, it's taken me a lifetime. And, you know, if I'm in front of a stimulus, a person that is activating a part of me that perhaps is less explored or resolved than another part, then I can be just as reactive as the next person. The difference is that afterwards I'll think, gosh, I was reactive. What was that about? You know, what what was what so it's back to the thing I said to you before, which is um relationship in relationships of any kind, 
um, people and my questions, not my answers, right? So what did what what came up for me in that moment? Why did I say that? Why was I defensive? Why was I hostile? Mm. Why was I shut down? Not, why was I defensive? Oh, why? You know, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no. no actually, why? And getting down to the root of each. Why was I? How interesting that every time I see this person, this feeling comes up. What does he or she remind me of? What's it reaching in me? Mm. And so I'm not hard on myself. I'm quite reflective, very forgiving. I know that. So I think it's um, to be able to be present enough to be thinking or to be aware of what's happening to me. Mm. You know, what's going on for me in this second? And it's almost, you know, if you're having a go at me, if you say, could you just hold on a second? Just listen. Oh, yes, my dad. Yeah, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like tune in. Yeah. Just remember to tune in because we get knocked off register all day long. We get knocked off register and it's just remembering that and knowing that I'm off register and I'm prone to that because I'm human and trying to draw myself back in to register, in, back in tune so that I'm more myself. Um, yeah. You know, and things to do that, well, I think self-care is self-esteem in action. Um, I think getting sufficient... Self-care is self-esteem in action. Yeah. Okay. So yep. if I, what comes first? I don't care about myself enough to take care of myself. Well, yeah. start with the action. Yep. Start with the action. Just have the discipline, excuse me, the discipline to clean up your sleep. You know, bank, I'm always talking about banking it. It's one of my say, sayings. I'm always saying to people, well, bank it. If it was a good moment, bank it. Mm -hmm. you know, Which you mean bank it? I mean, take it like you would with the bank, the money, right? right. You bank it in yourself. Right, right. So, um, because what we want is we want those moments of banking it, banking the, the good feeling to be conscious and uh, installed in the same place as the trauma. So you want it in the body, mm. right? You want the banking moment in the body. Yeah. So it's things like um, if you've decided, for example, that you're going to clean up your food for a week, whenever you manage to eat a meal and it's clean and it's healthy, it's like, yes. Yeah. You know, I did it. And you resist sugar and you go, No. No, you bastard. I'm not eating you. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Not this week. You have to wait till next week. Yeah, yeah. But this week I'm not going to. And then it's like, yeah. So you're... Is that you're, what you call him banking it? Yeah, I put, of... might put my hand on my body. I might put my hand on my right shoulder. I might put my hands on my gut and just be like, yeah, actually, you're all right. That's so, you're all right. That's a good exercise, actually. So it's like my hands I always think of as being now 2023, right? Date this podcast, but my yeah. hands are 2023. And the feeling might be back from when I was five. So I'm saying right here, right now, we're okay. Mm. We're good. We're good. We're all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so banking the moment. So clean up your sleep, clean up your food. As best that's you a can. massive thing for me is sleep. Yeah. Yeah. But it will be for the anxious stuff and the other thing. The, and, and I. I don't know what it is, I, but I can sleep if I wanted to. If I turn all electronics off, I can go to sleep quite easily. I don't sit up all night and 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 um, and not. But I, <laughs> yeah, well, I'll do something. I'll, I'll self-sabotage and stay up until like two, three for no reason. There's no reason for me to do it. Well, the, I'm, I'm sure you'll tell me otherwise, but there's no real reason no, for me you. to... <laughs> um, and do you I, like and I constantly quiet? do it. I const do you like the quiet of the night? I think it is that, yeah. I do. I really enjoy the quiet of the night. I feel like I'm, I'm just more at ease at night. And it's like I don't want to go to sleep because I, I, I'm enjoying this moment of just... of Nothing. Nobody, yeah. nobody else around. Nobody yeah. calling on you. I hear it a lot from people, which is why I asked it, because there is something about once everybody's gone to bed, there is this sort of no man's land. Quietness. Yeah. Mm. And so knowing why you're staying up late instead of saying I'm doing it for no reason yeah. means that you can dialogue with that part of yourself and say, mm. you know, I know what you're doing. You're staying up for the quiet. You can have half an hour of it, but then we really do need to go to bed. And maybe there's a place we can find this kind of quiet in the day if this is what you need. Ooh. You're good. <laughs> Good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was never the good girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> no. No. So, yeah. Let's get into the, more of that lifestyle, maybe. Mm. What, me? Not good? Yeah. No, I wasn't a very good girl. I mean, I In had a sense? really, 
I had a really good heart. I mean, it's unfair to say that because I was, I know from the work that I've done and the way I feel about myself is that um, there was a very hurt, misunderstood um, child yeah. growing up. Lots of stuff displaced onto me, lots of projection, lots of accusations of you are this and you are that. I, and that exact same lots thing. Lots of fear, mm -hmm. um, envy, aggression, all that stuff, and neglect. I mean, there was a lot of emptiness as well. So, for example, one of my weak spots as I went through recovery was um, being able to tolerate silence. Mm. Um, and I mean silence in relationships. So if I was dating someone and uh, they didn't call, I would panic. And what I would do is I would provoke a response, you know, ring, go by, whatever that was. And then I realised that this related to uh, bringing about the inevitable. The inevitable is that I'm going to get hit or rejected or blamed or something's going to happen. And waiting for that to come out of the blue was too painful as a child. Um, so what I did is I provoked it and I would do something that would bring it on. And my mum would say to me, why, why do you do this to yourself? You know, why do you behave like this? And I'd be like, because I don't give a shit. Right? It's not true. I gave a tremendous shit. Right? <laughs> I was actually shitting myself just to <laughs> extrapolate on the shit. Right? Um, but actually, so I believed that I didn't give a shit. I believed I was rebellious. I believed all those things. But later on, I realised that actually I was terrified mm. and I was trying to control the one thing I could control, which was the timing yeah. of the inevitable, which mm. is something bad's going to happen to me. Mm. Um, so I got into the provocative state where, you know, I would probably be very difficult to teach at school. I would run away from school. I was taking drugs by the time I was 14. You know, I was up and at them. I was, you know, tall and blonde and... Um, yeah, and and I didn't give a shit, or I believed I didn't give a shit. So boundaryless, daring, you know, what what else do you need to go into that mix to equals trouble? Mm. You know, and I found it. I did. I found it. But you're it. doing it to Yeah, like you said. On the run from able... myself, mm. on the run from being hurt, on the run from being vulnerable. It was too scary. I didn't know how to be angry. Um, I was frightened of anger, uh, and yet I would provoke it um, as a sort of inevitable part of relationship with me. Um, so, yeah, a lot of violence all through my teen years. I was on the sharp end of a lot of violence with relationships and all of that stuff, um, a lot of painful relationships. Mm. And eventually what really... Uh, brought me to my knees. I mean, I had the first signs of a stroke from Coke use. And of course, Coke's the perfect drug for that kind of presentation because it makes you think you don't give a shit. Mm. <laughs> perfect, right? And the next day you wake up and you're really paranoid. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. You know, hello, uh, here's my defense mechanism <laughs> yeah. in a packet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, hiding in chaos uh, and pretense of strength and arrogance and all of that stuff. Yeah, and I had uh, the first signs of a of a stroke. That didn't stop me. Um, but, you know, and then the guy I was with at the time where we'd had a very uh, traumatic relationship in many ways, um, he and I broke up and I was finished. That was it. I was on my knees. I was on my knees. And I remember going to, I was working in a production company, a uh, post-production company, and they agreed to fund the first part of the treatment. And I knew that was on the cards. And I hadn't been home for two weeks. I'd just been sofa surfing and pretty much on the run from myself. And I went to the Charter Nightingale Hospital in the Sun Grove. And I sat on the steps. And I remember sitting there with a joint, sort of like the, you know, up at six in the morning, waiting for them to open mm. <laughs> so I could check myself in. And I checked myself in. <laughs> And uh, and I remember it was, it was, I don't remember it like it was yesterday. I remember first I'm in the room like, oh, this is all right, you know, comfy bed and all of that. And then it's a bit like, feeling a bit trapped. <laughs> the windows only open that much, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, then I go down to where the stairs are. No, she says you can't go down there. You know, no, no, no. Go back to your room, and I'm like, no, 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 no. It's, I'm, I'm all right. I'm just, I'm going upstairs. 
no, you'll go back to your room. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. sort of a corridor around yeah. the, the rooms. And uh, and this therapist came in and he says to me, um, okay, he says, you know, we're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna give you any detox meds. No, we uh, we want you to come straight into group. So we want you in group tomorrow morning at nine nine or nine fifteen for check in. All right, all right, okay. And uh, he says, I'll see you in the morning. So next morning I've got something to do, so I get up. Oh, there, man. There's the orange seats in a circle, right, in this sort of very anodyne room. Mm. And uh, everybody's in there, and I go in and I sit down. And he says, okay, this is check-in. I want you to put your feet on the floor, because this is one of the first principles of getting well. I want you to put your feet on the floor. And I want you to take a breath, and I want you to check in with how you're feeling. And uh, so he's going around the room about how they're feeling. He comes to me, and I go, I'm fine. Uh, no, I went, I'm cool. I said, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm cool. And he goes, cool's not a feeling. And I went, well, I'm good. And he said, no, good's not a feeling. I went, I'm fine. And he went, oh, anybody want to tell Mandy what fine means? And this girl across the group went, fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> right? And I look at her and I just think, oh, you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, You've already got your enemy. For the, yeah, you're, <laughs> you are going to die. So I'm like, yeah, whatever. And he says to me, you know, you, you look angry. I'm not angry. He says, well, you look angry. And I go, you're yeah, I'm fucking angry. <laughs> he goes, great, end of group. So this was just a checking group. So at the end of the group, people... You got an emotion out of you. People are coming up and going, oh, I remember feeling like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nothing like me you know and people are going oh yeah. anyway 15 minutes later we go into the main group and everybody's sitting around again and he says um okay so i know you've all got something to bring but i thought let's get mandy up and running um you were angry this morning mandy do you want to just bring yourself into the room so of course i'm like yeah okay and a bit resistance and then i get into the flow of my story and how my car broke down and that's why i'm here and daddy mm. and he said okay can i just stop you there for one moment can i stop you there who thinks, who in this room thinks Mandy's a liar? Right. <laughs> Everyone put their hands up. Because uh, they're all bloody compliant. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and they were like that. And, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, whatever. I don't give a shit. Think what you fucking want. And uh, he said, so, you know, why do you think I did that? I don't give a fuck why you did that. I don't care why you did that. I went, Damn. four weeks. Four weeks I'm in here and then... Whoosh, I'm out of here. Just do your job. <laughs> I left that grief. I'm like, you did I do that? I would be here. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and it was, oh my God. Forget the coke, forget the drugs, even forget the men, forget all the stuff. In that moment, that was precisely the truth. I don't give a shit. Do what you fucking want. Mm. What a lie. Mm. And that's what I learned in rehab. That was the magic of rehab. I care. I just didn't know how to care yeah. because it hurt. Mm. And in rehab, I learned that that was the work I had to do. Wow. It was way beyond rehab, but that's what turned my head. I thought, that's a lie. Actually, I really care. How, how long into the rehab journey did you learn that? Uh, Mm, about the first week. The first week. I got that message. Yeah. I fought it. It's they like actually told me two weeks in, he the same therapist said, You're not doing the work. You know, you might as well leave. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Oh, I see. <laughs> and then about five weeks in, he said, You're going to too many meetings. Spend some time in your own skin. <laughs> Stay. <He's> like, oh, <laughs> oh. You know, I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know how to be in my skin. Mm. Yeah, there's loads of trauma, loads of sexual trauma, loads of drug trauma, loads of yeah. relational trauma, loads of aggression, loads of neglect, loads of all this stuff. And I just couldn't be in my skin. Mm. I couldn't. Could you maybe give any suggestions on how somebody can check in with themselves? Yeah, as in, how am I? Yeah, yeah. How, or like so. What people because I know do, there's a a lot of people don't realise that there's a there's a feeling inside. We get these sensations. Yeah, I mean, I always think as well. I'm not going to do the Spanish Inquisition. If there's a bit of me hiding behind that table, I'm not going to um, ask it loads of questions. Mm. Okay. I'm actually just going to try and just. Allow it to talk. It, okay. Attract it out. Yeah. Right? So first I want to be sitting here and I want to be saying to myself, it's okay if you don't feel anything at all. You know, you don't, body, you don't have to reply. I'm I just, like that because when you kind of put yourself pressure on, on to, yeah. to do something, it generally doesn't happen. It's like, it's okay, but I'm just going to try this as a discipline for the next two weeks and I'm going to jot down whatever comes up. 
Mm. And if it's nothing, it's nothing. That's okay. So then I would do that. And then first thing I ask people to do is to feel the physical sensation of their feet flat on the floor. Mm -hmm. Bum supported, lower back supported. So you start to think about, am I supported sitting here? Yep. Maybe I'll move that, maybe I'll move that. Yeah, I'm supported. Hands flat on the tops of your legs like that. You know, just bring your chin in a bit and breathe. And I'm saying breathe because when you send in oxygen, you're sending in permission. You're sending in the fuel to your body. If you're breathing, if you're worried, you're going to breathe just from the upper part of your chest, right? Mm. It's going to be very shallow. So send in permission, send in the troops, send in the love, send in the oxygen. <sighs> and then just listen and notice. Notice what's going on. And don't question it. And you might get tingling sensations, dread, weight, emptiness, quiet, numb, itchy. Your foot might want to be jogging. Your foot's jogging. It's not trying to stop it from jogging, but it's saying, no, what? What is it? I'm here. And let your foot rest and try to travel that energy up from your foot through your knee, your thigh, feel it pass through your hip, up through your body and out of your mouth. I don't know why, but I feel sick. So you just jot it down, I feel sick. And you just start to listen to yourself without judgment, without having to do anything with it. Just listen. And what you're saying to yourself is, I'm here for you. And I want us all to work together, mind, body, emotion, and soul. I'm just going to sit here a moment and see if I can catch up with myself. That's it. No judgment. Just listening. How do you feel? Relaxed. My kids always say that it's my Radio 4 voice. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I was about to say, have you done, it was called ASMR? No, what is that thing that... A EMDR. No, the, where people, they talk to the camera, but they do different sounds to yeah. the microphone, different sounds, are you correct? A-M-A-S-M-R. So, no, I haven't. Yeah. But I have done, I had a meditation that I put together for my kids when I was much, when they were much younger. And we had this way of just meditating them to go to sleep. And I have promised them I'll record it one day. Yeah. One time I was... You should doing, have like a, maybe an audio book or something of that. Yeah. And just, you know, people would be like dropping yeah. off to sleep yeah, all over the place. <laughs> the ch yeah. But there's a lot so of that. So from cocaine to, <laughs> to sleep, to sleep voice. Amazing. That's, that's yeah, the wonders journey. of life. It's the wonders of life, isn't it? I've gone from that to... Yeah. Now talking about, you know, yeah, it's the same. Having this meditative tone that just people... Why is, why is it that people that go through these experiences, come out the other end, want to help, want to... It's like a, it's an extra fuel to want to help people. And this is the reason yeah. why I'm doing this podcast and the reason why I'm doing this documentary is because I want to help people. But I didn't really have that before. Is it because you want to... to help? I mean, I get it, and that's a very noble cause... But if you want to help people, are people obliged to be helped? Is there a condition in there somewhere? I think when people say, I want to help people, there's an obligation as the recipient to be helped. There's a part of me anyway, back in the old day, that would resist that on mm. principle. <laughs> um, help's not trustworthy. But if you just want to share the news and it's up to me to hear it yeah. and to do what I want with it, then I'm free. Yeah. to ask and i think um you ask about why people who've been through something want well, to do that's something. what i mean it's um, step 12 get it the 12th. out then the people that will get help from it is the people that i want to so that's sharing the news yeah right? yeah that's what i mean and you know step 12 in the 12 step fellowship is about sharing the news mm. it's letting people see the evidence that mm. this shit works yeah that's so it's That's attraction it. over promotion. Yeah. Live it, be it. Yeah. If people want it, they'll follow. Yeah. Promote yeah. it, no. Yeah. Here to help you, 
how fucking dare you? <laughs> yeah. Because not everybody wants to be helped. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. But if you want to do I've it, learned. if you want to do I it because you love it, yeah, different. Yeah, there's that as well. And during the time that my parents got a divorce and stuff, yeah. and, um, my sister went through a really hard time, and I was doing all this sort of like healing work and all that, and I was trying to force that help onto her because yes. I knew that what I knew or understood yeah. could help her. Somebody who doesn't want to be helped cannot receive that information. So I did. Well, then, somebody who doesn't want to be told. Told, yeah. They may want to be helped. Yeah. Right, and they may want the help. Yeah. But the minute you turn up and, and say, you tell them. Yeah, then you take away some sense of autonomy. You take. I mean, I like being in people's company. And doing and having making that decision myself. You that can I make want it. To, yeah. yeah. You can ask. So that's why I think it's best to lead by example, isn't it? As opposed to then... But even that is... I mean, I know I'm picking... I know I'm being... A no, go for here, it. But, you know, hey-ho. <laughs> um, if, like <laughs> if, I, if I lead by example, then I'm not living my life. I just want to be authentic. I just want to be myself. And I, I went out with a guy once and he said, I've been going out with you for a while and you've never helped me. And I just sat there and thought, well, you never asked, <laughs> number one. Yeah. Two, you never made yourself available for it. It's not for me to come and help you. Mm. It's not for me to spot what's wrong with you. Like I'm, you know, no. Yeah. I'm, you know, we're in a peer relationship. You want to live like that, you've every right to. Yeah. You know, if that rocks your boat, knock yourself out. Um, but if you want something from me, ask. But I'm trying to live my most authentic life. And you're welcome to ask and I'll point you with what helped me. You know, but um, to proactively go out and help, I don't know. I mean, they would have to be legitimate victims. So like the earthquake in Turkey, you well, go out to help those people because they are victims. Yeah. They are seen yeah, 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 legitimate yeah. victims suffering from trauma. Yes, go and help mm. those people. But relationally, I think share the news, share the spread news. the word, live your authentic life, talk about it, be open, yeah. dump the shame, make it a good topic of conversation, but attraction over promotion. Mandy, you've been an amazing first guest. Thank you so much you, for having me. It's, it's Easy conversation. Easy conversation. Lovely. Uh, I'm sure we're going to do it again soon. Is there anything you'd like to say before we... No, thank you. I think it's a really important topic talking about trauma therapy change, personal yeah. change. Um, and just remember that it's not all darkness. You know, we've laughed a lot today. Yeah. And I think it's really important to remember that. Yeah.